Hi, I'm Alex Vitale, professor of sociology at Brooklyn College. Welcome to another episode of The Critical Criminologist. Today I'm joined by Forrest Stewart, author of The Ballad of the Bullet, which is a really exciting new book about the role of drill music in the lives of young people in Chicago. Stewart's associate professor of sociology at Stanford, but before that, he was at the University of Chicago, which, of course, uh, is nearby where the setting for this research was done. So, Stuart, can you start with a little overview about the book and also maybe tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the lives of these young people? Sure, absolutely. And, and thanks for thanks for having this conversation, Alex. This is really fantastic. So the book, I like to say that the book in, in large part is, I think, a long overdue look at the ways in which... Um, the proliferation of digital social media is changing daily life in poor urban, particularly predominantly black neighborhoods um, and using the South Side of Chicago as a case and focusing in large part on the ways in which social media have been transforming gang organization um, and gang warfare. Because in, in urban sociology, um, kind of gangs as these these informal organizations have kind of been a, a nice vehicle or window into seeing the ways in which macro social forces kind of make their way down to the street corner. And so so I've kind of used gangs in that way. Um, and so so there's these kind of three questions uh, that are that are driving the book. The first is um, how and why are young people, particularly gang affiliated youth, uh, how and why are they going on to social media uh, so frequently? And, and really, what are the consequences uh, of this? Um, what are the consequences for the way guys make ends meet, the way guys uh, carve dignity out of marginalized social spaces? Um, the ways in which violence is mediated by kind of digital worlds and then also how the criminal justice process, uh, criminal legal process um, is impacted by so many people being online. And um, this book actually began uh, not as a book about social media, not as a book about gangs even, not, not as a book necessarily about crime. I actually, um, prior to beginning this research around 2013, um, I, I hardly, I didn't have a Twitter account. I didn't have an Instagram account. Um, I was hardly on Facebook. I hate social media. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily a gang researcher. I've read tons of gang work, but I'm, I, I wouldn't consider myself a gang researcher. Um, I consider myself a policing scholar and a sociologist of policing and poverty. And I had moved to Chicago after, after being in Los Angeles and doing a bunch of work on policing in Skid Row. And one of the things that I found in my first book, Down Out and Under Arrest, um, was that this kind of constant fear of policing was changing the ways that people kind of moved through physical and social spaces in their neighborhoods. And given that Skid Row, where I did this work, is like such a kind of unique place, I remember and I would give these talks and people would be like, oh, but that's that's Skid Row. That's not like a, a typical poor place, a typical poor neighborhood. That's not like... You know, that's not, you know, Chicago South Side or the Bronx or East St. Louis. And I found myself trying to kind of remind people that, like, these are transferable processes, you know, the kinds of ways that policing gets under our skin and into our brains um, is generalizable. And so I got to Chicago maybe feeling a little defensive. I started sitting down with with kids, teens you know, 13 year olds through about 19 year olds. And I sit down with a, a, a tablet with a map of the South side of Chicago and I'd have them show me how they navigate around policing. And so we'd have these really cool conversations, deep, rich conversations about, you know, I, I go down this street so that like the cops don't stop me on my way to school, and, like do all this stuff. Same and thing then, you ident same thing you identified yeah, in the previous yeah. book. Some of, some of the same Changed stuff. people's and, geographies. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, of course, I felt I felt good about this. Um, but then something really interesting happened. It's about half an hour into our conversation. The kids would say, OK, 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 yes, I'm avoiding police, but I'm also avoiding gangs. And I really want to talk about that stuff. And and reluctant at first, you know, because this is, was a project about policing, reluctantly at first, um, I just I, I began kind of letting them tell me about um, what what a what a colleague of mine called kind of like a 
uh, uh, a hall of mirrors, like funhouse mirrors, how they were constantly like for the cops, they had to present in one way and then they'd walk down two blocks and for like a local gang and have to present another way. And they were just constantly doing all this kind of self presentation and modification. And after a while, you know, I'd, I'd end, you know, I'd have this tablet and I, you know, have this map and we'd have all these routes and then all these gang territories, you know, shaded in different colors. And it was, it was kind of mind boggling. And, and I remember I turned to, to one of the young men pretty early on in these interviews and I said, you know, like you've identified like 30 different gang territories. Some are like miles away from your house. Like and not just identifying the gang territories, but identifying like how many members were in it, what guns they had at the time. You know, it was like, oh, they've got like three pistols. They've got a, I don't know, an AR-15. They've got this, they've got that. He'd be able to tell me who was locked up from every gang at any given time. He'd be able to tell me who was at war with whom, who had formed an alliance with whom over the last week, over the last month, how those had shifted. And I, and I was just like so bowled over with uh, this young man, not a gang affiliated young man, you know, just a guy who had to walk through these territories. And I was like, you know, how do you know all this stuff? And he kind of looked at me like I was a total idiot and was like, you know, social media, what are you talking about? And he essentially explained to me that by being a young person, by being a young person who's online, he kind of like had passively gained these things simply by going on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube to consume culture the way that teens do. So much of the culture was being made by the local gangs and the local guys in his neighborhood that there was no way that he couldn't learn about this stuff, right? So guys were making songs and uploading them, music videos and uploading them to YouTube. And this is the thing that I kind of grabbed onto. Guys were making songs, uploading them to YouTube, talking about the drive-by shooting that happened yesterday. We're talking about the rivalry that was just established two days mm -hmm. ago. We're talking about the truce that they had formed with somebody that morning. And it became very clear that if I wanted to understand the daily experiences, not just of, you know, policing in neighborhoods, but just of social life and kind of the, you know, as an ethnographer, paying attention to like what matters to the people in the situations that, that I'm interested in, like what really what are they thinking about when they wake up in the morning? Um, I knew that I had to start thinking about social media. I knew that I had to start going and talking to the young people who were making this content. And so that's what I did. Um, you know, through one of these interviews, I actually was talking about like, oh, there's this one particular gang. They're making all these YouTube videos, music videos. Uh, and, and this young man was like, oh, that's, that's my brother. Um, you know, do you want to meet him? I can bring him in tomorrow and you can sit down and do the same interview with him. Uh, and I did, you know, this, this young man was, was one of the shooters, one of the trigger men in, in one particular gang, uh, was pretty notorious. He's, he's got song lyrics about him, about his exploits. And so, you know, I, I knew of this person uh, previously. So he came in, um, and we just had like this, we hit it off immediately and had this really great like two hour conversation. And he, I think was, was pretty, pretty tickled, I guess is the, the, the only way to describe it. And the fact that like, I knew so much about him, you know, like it's, it's like a, you know, 19 year old young man. And here's like this 30 something professor coming out of the blue and is like, Oh yeah, two years ago you did this. Or like, Oh yeah, you, you did like a two year sentence uh, at this point in time where you were on house arrest, like last May. And he's like, you, how do you know all these things? And I ended up saying back to him what the young people had said to me, which is social media, you know, like I've been watching your videos. I've, I've, you know, friended you on, on, uh, or followed you on Twitter, these kinds of things. And so, um, this guy, this young man, um, I refer to him in the book as Zebo. He introduced me to his gang faction. Uh, I refer to these guys as the corner boys, um, which is short for corner boys entertainment or CBE for short, which I think is like just so telling. Um, of the current state of, of gang factions on the south side of Chicago, that these guys aren't calling themselves, you know, some classic traditional gang name. Like, right. their gang is such and such entertainment. Um, they right? almost so, need to add, like, <laughs> LLC at the end. <laughs> right, right, yeah. And so it's just, I mean, at every step of the turn, uh, every, every, every step of the way, you know, there were little things like this, like what young men decide to name their gang faction or... You know, these little things just really kept reinforcing to me that, like, 
you know, while we tend to talk about kind of material economic conditions while we're discussing or theorizing or analyzing urban poverty, um, what has seemed to be missing for me, at least for sociologists, for, for, for a lot of criminologists, though there are some kind of cultural criminologists thinking about this stuff, is the role of culture and the role of cultural production and the role of music and aesthetics and art and those kinds of things. Um, and so, so what I'm hoping is that this book not only gets us thinking about how the digital economy interfaces with urban poverty and urban poor neighborhoods, but also kind of putting it out there that like there's a whole lot of kind of beautiful, creative, innovative cultural production happening in neighborhoods that are typically seen as wholly unproductive, right? Like if we think about neighborhoods where there's not a whole lot of lot of employment, neighborhoods that are not generating a whole lot of tax revenue, if we only like narrowly think about it like that, they look very unproductive. But if we zoom out and we think about who the cultural producers are who are driving popular culture, not just in America, but across the globe, it's folks like this young man on the South side um, who are generating the TikTok videos, right? The dance crazes that everybody's doing during quarantine, uh, during shelter in place, who are generating the memes that circulate on Twitter, who are generating the SoundCloud music and the YouTube videos that then get picked up by major record labels or you know major artists and remixed and then repackaged for us so i yeah so i just i i, I just really want us to be thinking about culture a whole lot more when we think about urban poverty and crime you know the problem though is that uh, neoconservatives want to point to those same cultural connections to you know make accusations of of cultural inadequacy cultural poverty cultural violence and so, you know, we're back to kind of relitigating the culture wars of the 1980s. So how, how was that? How do you feel like you've added to that conversation uh, now, 40 years after that kind of conversation <laughs> begins in the 80s? Oh, boy. And that conversation is still going on. Um, and, and, and I think that, that a lot of what I'm trying to do in this book is crack open, I think, the reality of what is often spoken about by folks who don't actually know a whole lot about what's going on in these neighborhoods, right? So much, so much of those, so many of those narratives are being spun by people who like have never actually sat down and spoken with any of the young people that they're talking mm -hmm. about. Um, and so a lot of this book is, you know, quite descriptive in that sense. And I think importantly descriptive and just saying like, we have so many conceptions and misconceptions about what's going on, why these young people are making this stuff the way in which this content does or does not link up to violence. We have so many conceptions about that stuff, but those conceptions are rooted in like zero data. And so I thought if I could provide some data, um, then maybe we could have a little bit more of an intelligent conversation about this stuff. Now, whether that intelligent conversation can, can actually go on in the political moment or the political climate that we have is another question. Uh, but as a social scientist, I think first I wanted to produce the data. Um, and, and, and a lot, a lot's the same, you know, the, the more things change, the more they stay the same. I mean, I think that there are, you know, I think back to like, again, the, the kind of um, the fodder of the culture wars of like the 80s and 90s. We think about like groups like NWA, right, or Ice Cube or, you know, gangster rap um, kind of in its traditional form. And, you know, this this was some of that content that I would say, yeah, the the right wing used to say, like, look, like these these young folks are like willful criminals. You know, we are right to lock them up. They are unremorseful. And I think at that time, the way I read it, there was a whole lot of emphasis placed on consumption on the consumption side that, that there was this narrative at the time that like. If you listen to this music, you will start to hate cops. You will start uh, to want to deal the drugs. Explicit lyrics, warnings. Right, right. So it was about consumption, I think, in the 1980s and 1990s, which 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 matched up with with Dare really nicely, which was about let us turn you into people who aren't going to consume bad things. So a lot of it was about like how do we stop these messages from hitting you and turning you into you know a a, a bad person. I think this has now been reversed, actually. Um, and I think it's been reversed precisely because all those structures, all the institutions 
of the music industry, of gatekeepers, of tastemakers, of record labels, those have kind of like been pushed aside, right? That NWA had to go through all these, they had to go through record labels, they had to go, I think it's maybe like Interscope or, or whoever, right? And it was, it was like, so much of their stuff was curated. But now the young people who are the, the primary cultural producers, like the Corner Boys that I write about in this book, I mean, they don't have to go through record labels. They don't have to go through A and R. They don't have to go. They, they they make a YouTube video today and put it up on YouTube tonight, and it's hitting millions of viewers around the globe um, immediately. And um, so, I think now much of the critique has shifted away from a focus on consumption to a focus on production, and we can see it um, in the ways that, say, like the police talk about these young people um, in 2016. I don't know if you remember 2016, there was a whole lot of panic because the Chicago homicide rate had a had a had a yeah, big spike. It was a temporary spike. It went it, it certainly went back down and it's tragic, right? The fact that it spiked and we have, you know, people losing their lives. But in January, once they started to see the rates looking a lot higher than in previous years, um, the the police superintendent at the time, uh, the mayor at the time, it seemed like every politician in Chicago was looking around trying to figure out why this was going on. And, and one of the number one things they landed on was social media and YouTube and this new kind of gang affiliated gangster rap that was kind of DIY homemade that I that I write this book about. And they put out this, um, right, the Chicago Tribune writes about it. There's all kinds of press about it. They say crime is being driven by young producers of social media who are taunting each other. They're using these YouTube videos to escalate gang conflicts. Um, and so this is the narrative, and I think it was bought by most, most people. Um, but the problem is, and I, and, I, and I point this out in the book, that like, this thing, like if we're making causal arguments about social media directly driving crime, that actually the fact that crime went down and crime has been down at precisely the moment when tons of young people are going on social media at these incredible numbers. I think it shows us that we can't draw a strong causal link between social media and crime, that there's all kinds of other things going on. Um, I think criminologists, as you know, like have actually a really hard time figuring out why crime goes up and down when it actually does. I mean, we know there's certain factors, but to, but to, but to lay blame on the feet of, of social media, um, one is not backed up by any kind of, of causal analysis or even correlation. Um, and two, uh, and, I, and I write about this <clears throat> extensively in the book, is actually at odds with what I think is actually going on in these moments of, of young folks uploading this stuff. And, and one of the big arguments that I make is that when you open up that YouTube video of this guy rapping in front of his housing project, or you open up his Instagram and he's out on the corner with his buddies, that most of this stuff, I would say the vast majority of this stuff is hyper exaggeration yeah. and sometimes just pure artifice, you know, that like standing <clears throat> next to these young people, you know, I, one, one example that I, that I share in the, that I share in the book is about this moment when I'm sitting in, in one of these young men, his name's AJ, I'm sitting in AJ's apartment and we're babysitting his kids, you know, we're watching his kids and he's like doting on them as this kind of caring father figure running into the kitchen and grabbing them juice and like setting up the Xbox. And, you know, we're sitting on the couch and it's, it's, it's actually this really loving moment. And I'm watching his Instagram as we're sitting there. It's one of the things that I did quite often is I, I observed people offline and then watched how they were presenting what they were doing in an online space. And in that moment, he posts a picture of himself and the rest of his gang standing out on the corner as though daring, you know, the his rivals to come and do a drive-by. Like, come slide on us, come slide on us. Like, yeah, giving this taunt. And it was in the mid middle of, like, the Chicago winter, so it's cold and snowy outside. And so if you're not sitting there with him in his living room watching him dote on his kids, you would have, you would, you would say, oh, my God, this guy not even like, you know, 30 degree weather is, is stopping this guy from going out on the corner and gangbanging, right? And so it's like, that's what the Chicago PD, that's what the mayor's office, that's what the media is, is seizing on without ever actually asking, is this real? Is this, is this stuff actually real? Um, yeah, and so, 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 
unfortunately, we are relitigating it, but I'm hoping that this book gives maybe a little bit more ammunition uh, to litigate it in a way that's maybe a, a bit more data driven. You know, on, on on the one hand, you do provide this, you know, incredibly nuanced, humanizing picture of these young people who are not super predators, but also are involved in some cases in violence and, and uh, drug dealing and other activities, not at the scale they exaggerate on their videos. Uh, but but also you, you do show that that the the development of these social media profiles does enmesh them in certain kinds of risk profiles. <clears throat> I think what what's important, though, is that it's not like these neighborhoods would be otherwise completely nonviolent, safe places. It's that violence now is organized to some extent around these narratives, which then gives the police something to like focus their yeah. their vilification around so right, it becomes right. the kind of new super predator uh, right. kind of framework yeah and, and i love i i really appreciate you pointing that out because i mean I've, I've i've worked really hard and i think this is one of the hardest parts about writing this book right that it's we're i i feel like you know, sociologists, social scientists, ethnographers, folks writing about urban marginalization are pulled into between these two poles, right? That like you either play up this kind of romantic, saintly vision of people, which is, I mean, in my case, it's inaccurate. Sometimes these guys are doing some pretty terrible yeah. things. Or, or you you slide the other way, which is like portray them as like these hardened criminals, uh, super predators, which I think we, we can think of books that have gone that way as well. Um, so it's it's I'm I'm glad you point that out and I and I and you you make this really good point, um, which is like to what extent is social media just the latest shiny object, right? That the police kind of put in everyone's forefront of their mind that they that they aim at, and and what does that shiny object distract us from, right? And and I think in the book what I'm trying to say is what it distracts us from is the fact that like. Where these kids are operating in some of the worst inequality that America has ever experienced, right? That like, I mean, the, the young people, um, you know, who who are in this book are, you know, going days without eating, right? Because they're just that broke, or you know, some of them are living homeless in stairwells of housing projects or in the backs of cars. Um, you know, the same conditions that that push young people into informal economics that are inherently dangerous, that don't have the protection of the law. Um, and so and so one of the things I'm trying to do is as people focus on that shiny object, I'm trying to put that shiny object of social media within its socio historical mm -hmm. context. Right. Which is to say, OK, well, what explains and, and what were the conditions that young folks were facing before social media? And to what extent does social media fit into that? Um, and and <clears throat> the historical account that I'm that I'm trying to get us to think about is that, uh, you know, if this was the 1990s, if the crack account when the crack economy was booming, which was also driving some of that violence, you know, if you're 13, you maybe can rely on if you join a gang being outfitted perhaps with a corner with a pack with 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 some drugs you sell these you control the corner well enough you can work your way up into an organization which is for a lot of young people um the most dignifying and most stable option they have compared to like low-wage service industry or i don't know what else really is there right but <clears throat> at the turn of the century, these things start to start to erode. The crack economy starts to erode. The kind of corporate gang structure that you know folks like Sudhir Venkatesh write about, like that, starts to balkanize. And now, if you're 15 years old in 2012, 2020, you're looking around like, whoa, all these things that used to be a way of making ends meet, or used to be a way of me carving out even just a little bit of dignity out of this like incredibly anti-black, anti-poor country that we're living in, you look around and like those things are gone. Um, and so you're scrambling really hard to find ways of making ends meet, ways of getting that dignity. Social media arises and, um, you know, you can start using social media essentially in the ways that like everybody's using social media, which is if you grow yourself, your public profile, your online profile big enough, maybe you can start making some money. Um, maybe you can punch your ticket out of poverty. And in the meantime, 
you're collecting likes, you're collecting self-worth, you're getting people day in and day out to say you're special, you're worthwhile. Um, we can quantify that, right? Your followers yeah. is an indication of like how much people want to hear from you. Um, so we've got folks turning turning to that in this kind of historical moment, but yeah, it, it, it does put them into these really difficult situations. Um, well, you know, it's like, uh, yeah. you, you, it's interesting, it's a continuation of some of like Elijah Anderson's work where he says, well, the old heads of 40 years ago, 50 years ago, they could maybe hook you up with, with a job cleaning, light construction, you know, it was something yeah. working in a mail room. But then 30 years ago, those jobs were not, became harder and harder for these young people to get. So then that starts that generation creating these more elaborate drug organizations. And then you mm -hmm. point out that even that pathway is no longer available. Right. That the, 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 the paranoia about snitching and the drug conspiracy cases, you know, causes this balkanization. And so now these young people are left with the, not even the likelihood of getting hired at McDonald's. Like even McDonald's is not really available right. to these kids. That's even, that's a myth. Uh, uh, yeah. And so it's really, the, the options are so few and far between. And then you present this complex economics, which is remarkably analogous to that earlier drug story, right? Which is, it's that, mm -hmm. that money is made, but it's not a lot of money. It's episodic. It's not consistent. And it comes with a lot of risks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This, um, I'm, I'm so Alex, <laughs> I'm so, I'm so grateful that you, yeah, you, you, you've read this book closely and, and, and I love, I love the fact that you're pointing out some of those continuities, those continuities. Um, yeah, so so now with this risk, th and this is one, um, this was a, this was a kind of finding and discovery that I think took me a while to try and figure out. There's this really complex kind of industry and ecology that these young folks have built. Um, and it took me a while to kind of make sense of it. But but here's the, here's the, um, the way that I've made sense of it and, and, and how it relates to like what the new sources of risk are and, and when there is violence, how that violence is actually empirically tied to social media. And it is really rooted in the fact of um, if during the 90s, if during that kind of corporate drug time, if violence then was the means to ensure the success of your commodity drugs right violence was uh, was was to protect the commodity now violence has actually become the commodity or the representation of violence online has become the commodity so they're commodifying images of violence um, in the service of trying to convince the online world that they are authentically um, this kind of hardened homicidal, gangster. So so what they're actually trying to do is convince the world via social media that they're that trope from back in the 90s. They're the guy in the wire, right? They're the guy in all of our favorite 80s. They're the guy from Boys in the Hood. They're the guy from Menace to Society. Like it's almost like they 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 in this digital age they're like harkening back to how I would say the majority of the public imagines poor urban neighborhoods, how they imagine the ghetto, which doesn't look like it looked in the 1990s. Um, but like these guys are trying to project themselves as like these drug kingpins online. Um, and so in order to do that, they have to use social media to present like these coherent, consistent images. Um, a, a really great example of this that that I don't I don't think I included in the book, but I included in some other writings. There was a there was a young man who I met throughout this research who is not gang affiliated strongly. He's kind of on the periphery of one of these gangs. He doesn't own a gun, <clears throat> but one day his cousin came over and had a handgun. And this young man, knowing the fact that if you have a handgun on your Instagram, you get lots of likes and people talk about you. And when you go to the lunchroom the next day at school, people are like going to treat you like you're, you know, a tough guy. Women are going to look at you differently. You know, the guys who are maybe picking on you might not pick on you as much. And so he knew the kind of symbolic value of a handgun. 
and the symbolic value of a handgun on, on Instagram in particular. And so what this young man did for about 15 minutes, he borrowed this handgun from, from his family member and proceeded to take about 15, 12 to 15 pictures of himself and the handgun in different outfits. Right. Right. So change your outfit. Take different backgrounds. Yourself, different backgrounds. Um, and then what he's able to do is he has two weeks worth of content. Right. So imagine the power of, yeah, one image with a gun or two weeks worth of a daily image with a gun um, in different outfits. What you come to think is that this person is actually, um, you know, armed to the teeth for, you know, multiple days, that this is his gun, that this is his actual lived reality, that this is his personality. When this, this young man, it, it, it was not, this was not, this was not the truth. But in this world where everybody's vying for that popularity online, if I want to steal some of that popularity you have, uh, what kids in Chicago call clout. I think we all kind of think of clout and can understand this, this notion of clout. One of the best ways that I can raise my online profile is by sabotaging or ridiculing yours, right? So to show that, hey, I think this guy's faking. Let me show you different ways that I think he's faking. And this can, you know, mostly it's kind of online. Here's a picture of him, a cute picture of him with his mom online. I'm gonna put this on his Instagram or tag him. But sometimes, and this is when it gets risky, um, you know, while someone, while this young man is like out at the grocery store with his mom, or while this young man is out with his family at the beach, if I see him and I'm a rival or I'm a competitor or I wanna boost my cloud on social media, if I see him out there, the thing that young people in Chicago are, are doing is I pull out my camera phone, I walk over to you. If I have a gun, I pull it out. If I've got my boys with me, we threaten you. We put you down to your knees. We make you beg for your life. We make you say disparaging things about your gang. And then we post that stuff online. <clears throat> so what you have now is this new mode of uh, gaining street cred, of building a name, that the code of the street now is operating online as well. Um, so any, any kind of time when you're out in public, you now have to kind of weigh the risks of, do I turn off that online persona and act as a son or a brother or a boyfriend? Or do I have to continue trying to live out my online profile offline. And so this is this is creating, I think, a new set of risky situations. At the same time as creating that though, I, I really do wanna stress, and I stress throughout the book that most of the time, you know, uh, these kind of uh, campaigns for respect are staying online. Um, they're definitely staying online. And, and, and I, I try to make that point precisely because this is one of the points in my research that, that law enforcement likes to pick up and kind of use very selectively to say, oh, look, you know, this Stewart guy is showing that like when you post something online, then somebody else tries to come and come and shoot you for it. Um, and I and I think that that if we pulled back for a moment and we actually had a sample or if we saw the universe of all the challenges that were going on on a given day, say just on the south side of Chicago between people online, we're talking hundreds of thousands of tweets and Instagram images and memes and videos. If there, if there was this one-to-one -one relationship between like an insult on social media and a shooting that the police like to talk about, there would be no one alive left on the south side of Chicago at the end <laughs> yeah. of this year. Like it just wouldn't happen, right? There's this notion of like tweet, shoot, tweet, shoot, tweet, shoot, which just isn't actually true. And I think what's actually, what's happened is that we've been caught up in this kind of confirmation bias, right? That a shooting happens, somehow someone is able to make yep. some link to a Twitter feud. And then we use that one to confirm this kind of notion, this mythology that we already have. But what that leaves out is the hundreds of thousands of online insults and taunts and challenges and antagonisms that never, ever, ever lead to a shooting. That if we added those to the analysis, I think we'd walk away saying, wow, it's really ludicrous to think that there is some kind of strong causal relationship between, you know, an insult on Twitter and, and, and a shooting offline. You know, uh, one of the one of the arguments that was made during, you know, the culture war in the early 90s around gangster rap was that, well, 
you know, you may not like it, but it is an authentic expression of huh. the actual lived conditions of these young people. And we have to respect that, that the the misogyny and the violence is is the world that they are embedded in. And and you actually, you know, you point out, well, actually, a lot of this is exaggeration. That, mm -hmm. And that one of the audiences for this is not just the kids at the local middle school that they have lunch with, but also this kind of white suburban audience that's feeding off this right. exaggerated violence and and drug dealer lifestyle, et, et cetera. And, you know, so that we can, I think there's room to have a kind of critique about mm -hmm what's being produced here without falling into like respectability politics or criminalization. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about uh, some of the discourse around minstrelsy, which mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I kept thinking would show up in the book somewhere yeah. and doesn't quite, obviously you, you, you do bring these issues to bear, but, uh, but that, that's something that I think, you know, no matter how carefully you write this, you're going to yeah. get <laughs> blowback from, from some of these corners. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and I think you're, you're spot on, you know, there's this, this word minstrelsy was certainly circulating in my own head while I was watching a lot of this stuff. And, um, I mean, I, I, I do think in some respects we can think about this in this term of minstrelsy. And of course, like kind of classic minstrelsy, we're thinking of like blackface, we're thinking of, you know, white performers putting on blackface, playing stereotypes. The fact that these are, are young black men, I think does not necessarily mean that they can't also be doing a kind of blackface and and you know well I some black some minstrelsy was black right. minstrelsy yeah a absolutely and and I think the the key the core aspect of this is the kind of performance of stereotypes right and performance of stereotypes that are certainly not the most flattering stereotypes that are essentializing and the performance of stereotypes in the way in ways that end up actually reifying those kinds of stereotypes and 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 i i, I think that like this is this is absolutely happening and and it's actually happening on a conscious level which was which was something that um something that really shook me while I was doing the research and something that I don't think I've necessarily seen written about a whole lot um, on a kind of conscious level that, 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 that these young men who I came to know were articulating outright for me. I remember there, there was, you know, a few conversations that we had that just kind of blew this open for me. And one of them actually happened. I don't mention this in the book, actually. One of them happened at the time when Spike Lee was filming the that shy this terrible horrible Chirac film in Chicago. Yeah. So I'm sitting this young man AJ who I write quite quite a bit about in the book. I'm we're sitting a few blocks away from the neighborhood where Spike Lee, a New Yorker, has come <laughs> to Chicago to make a film called Chirac who is talking about the young man who I'm sitting next to essentially, right? gangster rappers who are uploading things and they're feuding and it's musical and it's cultural. So like this guy's sitting there and he's like, Forrest, isn't this crazy that this dude, this multimillionaire is coming into my city to write about me in this hyper stereotyped way to portray me as the Chirac savage. The Chirac savage is like this term that like was used quite a bit by these young men. Like he's trying to like, he's trying to make money off of me and, and like the stereotypes that are put on me. And he he quite literally said, no, 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 that's not going to happen anymore. If people are going to make money off of like these, these stereotypes of me, I should be the one who's able to do this stuff. And it, it, this, this conversation just like totally blew my mind. And I began kind of digging, digging into it and having conversations with other young men and to a man, they all kind of recognized what was going on, recognized that they were playing on stereotypes, recognized that there were certain images even in like constructing a music video that they would say like creates emotions out of non-black, non-poor audiences, right? So like a broken street light or a, a, a crack addict, a hype as they, they refer, a hype walking down the street um guns yeah i mean you name it uh syringes or broken vials on the street so like abandoned when, buildings yeah yeah so when guys would come when when they'd be recording music videos 
there would be like, time out, time out, stop. Let's get some B-roll. Get this syringe. Oh, here comes a hype coming up the street. Get the hype, right? So it was, it was very clear, right, that they were trying to package the ghetto for people who are too afraid to come to the ghetto, who are not allowed, who disparage uh, a poor black neighborhood. So that they're, they're consciously packaging it for them. So in that respect, there, there's quite a bit of minstrelsy. Um, and, and, and these things are being bought up wholesale. Um, you know, one of the kind of craziest experiences that I, I, I talk about this in the book is this trip I take with a young yeah. man, Junior, to Beverly Hills, that there's this fan, this super fan of theirs, a CBE super fan, this rich guy, 20 something, who lives in Beverly Hills, white kid, who really, really wants to meet Junior and really, really wants to meet the members of CBE. So he flies him out to Beverly Hills for almost two weeks, um, ends up giving him $3,000. And it's really, um, he wants to live the experience that he was having digitally online, right? So he's seeing them do all these things in their music videos and Instagram. And so it's not enough for him. So he flies him to Beverly Hills. He, he gets him to teach him how to roll a blunt. Uh, <laughs> they have they have some of like the most, this was actually one of the, one of the most difficult experiences I've ever had as a field worker was sitting in this guy, I refer to as Chad Campbell in the book, sitting in Chad Campbell's living room with Junior and having Chad Campbell ask Junior questions about having sex with black women. Right? <laughs> that, like this is his his way. He like this is a kind of sexual racial transgression that this young man romanticizes and feels is taboo and off limits because what will his dad say and what will his friends say? And he, he doesn't really know any black people anyway. Um, and so he has this young man in his room, so in his, in his living room, so he can kind of almost live it vicariously through this, through this young, through this young, young black man from, you know, this poor neighborhood in Chicago. Um, so, so I think, you know, again, it, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. You're, 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 you're you pointing this out to minstrelsy that let's like as new and as supposedly disruptive as we like to think about social media being it turns out that like the continuities yeah. uh historical continuities are just you know glaring and chad chad doesn't just want to have this encounter with the other right he wants to be seen with the other right to boost his own sense of like exoticness because he actually has a black friend now who's from mm -hmm. the ghetto, right? Wow. So burnishing up their own image through these public associations. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I, one of the things that Chad really wanted to do was to, to saturate his own Instagram profile with, uh, with this guy, Junior. But it also, it also um, I think this is nice in that it reveals what so much of this kind of like new economy uh, kind of hinges on, which is to remind or introduce the public to your social networks, which is to say like, hey, I'm a certain kind of person because I know this authentic gang gang member from Chicago. Um, and guys in Chicago would do this all the time. Um, if, if you wanna convince somebody that you're like an authentic, uh, authentic gang member involved in violence, you start to look around to say like, oh, who's about to get arrested? Or like, who's involved in a gang feud? Who's involved in this? Who's involved in that? And they'll reach out to them and try to say, make a music video with them or try to link up so they can take selfies together. That like Chad is, is, is doing this thing that is um, actually pretty prevalent. And it's like the, the, the more authentic a person can project themselves on social media, the more people they'll have trying to take selfies with them. And then these guys actually monetize that, that they they then um, start charging people uh, for appearances in their music videos or or even like to take Instagram photos with them. You know, they 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 start racking up prices. Um, yeah. But then a lot of that money that comes in flows back out to pay people to write beats for them, to to do high level video production. So it's a lot like you know black cultural production of the past, right? Where mm -hmm. it's the record executives who make the real right. money off those Motown recordings. Right, right. And this is, this is, 
I'm, uh, this is another point that I that I I wrestle with in the book because I too you know fall into the seduction of like oh my gosh social media has like flattened out hierarchies or it's eliminated the gatekeepers and it's eliminated the taste democratize like, right yeah. right there's this notion that we've democratized things and like it's we're just fed it so much even as someone who's in these moments like this was something that was hard for me to shed and just like actually look at the data and as you point out just because you know, the a &R head or the CEO sitting in a flashy building in Los Angeles, just because those people aren't necessarily controlling the relationship between these young men and audiences doesn't mean that there isn't some set of parties mediating that, right? And, and so in a world where I want to get maximum exposure of my music video, it sure does help to solicit or hire a videographer to shoot my music video who's got a YouTube channel with like multiple millions of subscribers. Because I know as soon as the video goes up on his page, all of his subscribers are going to see this. That's opposed to me if I were to just like shoot a music video, open up, uh, start up a YouTube channel. I've got like one subscriber. Maybe my mom is watching, my boys are watching. But like that's the extent to which, you know, this stuff's going to go out. Well, those guys who, who command these large followings on YouTube, they charge, you know, hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars yeah. to these already cash-strapped young men. Um, and what's wild, what I didn't realize until far later on in my project, was that the guys who are posting this on their YouTube channel are in this real still murky gray area around intellectual property, are actually in copyright law, are actually kind of the owners, they own the rights essentially to this content. So these young men are like giving away their content, not just for free, but are paying yeah. other people to give them their content. And then that person not only takes the money, takes the content, but in this new wild world we're living in are monetizing that content through Google's AdSense program, um, and now are embedding advertisements in the video, in banners, on somebody else's content. And then Google is cutting those people a check every month for every click through, for every view of the video. So, so we're, what we're seeing, yes, sure, we're not seeing exploitation, a kind of capital labor exploitation in the same way that we saw, like, I don't know, uh, music moguls, you know, screw over TLC and like leave them bankrupt after like platinum albums. We're not seeing that same structure. We're seeing a new structure of exploitation, but that new structure of exploitation is still exploitation. Um, and, and, and I think, and I, and I think we really need to be reckoning with this, particularly the more popular these young people's content is becoming. I think it's opening up even more doors for this kind of exploitation that, wow, what a great way to, what a terrible way to reward some of the, our best creative, innovative cultural producers is to like, uh, separate them from any kind of rewards, um, real monetary rewards that they would get for, for, for that artistry. Well, you'll be getting my bill for this interview uh, after we finish talking here uh, with my dozens of viewers. Uh, so I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about your your previous book, which uh, which I you know loved and felt a very strong attraction to. You know, I got my start in this uh, work working at the San Francisco Coalition on Homelessness, looking at the first iteration of the, the criminalization of homelessness in the late 80s and early 90s. So um, I really appreciated your take on that subject, in part because I think a lot of academics, like the politicians, have kind of thrown up their hands about homelessness. And it is, it is not, you know, it's just become accepted that this exists. There's not much we can do with it there about it. There's not much critical engagement. It's not part of the political discourse, and there's not a lot of academic research about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and I will say your book was immensely helpful as I was as I was doing my work. I I, I discovered your work as a grad student, and it, it just totally informed. You're uh, talking about book. City of Disorder. Yeah, City of Disorder. Yeah. yeah, City of Disorder was so helpful. I mean, I think you laid out the theoretical terrain in a way that like I hadn't necessarily seen it. And suddenly things in Skid Row that I was writing about for Down Out and Under Rest started to make sense. Uh, so thank so so thank you. And gosh, you know, you're you're so right. I 
you're so right about this kind of throwing up your hands uh, and, and, you know, homelessness in particular uh, as this thing that just seems, you know, politically intractable, you know, this kind of not a problem of resources, a problem of will. There is like, sur- you know, surprisingly little will in terms of trying to tackle homelessness and, and not just that, but also like, um, yeah, you're not winning very many voters over by by saying you're going to do something about homelessness. And, and you know, of course, as, as someone who has studied homelessness quite quite a bit. You know, I, I think a lot of this has to do with a larger discourse politically in the media, but I think also in academia that maybe unwittingly, but I think it's beneficial, separates homelessness from poverty in this really weird, mm-hmm. really odd way, right? And 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 so, so you know, so I, I, I write this book about Skid Row and people are moving on and off the streets all the time, right? Once you get below a certain kind of income level, like housing precarity is just a fact of life, whether it's in a shelter, on a friend's couch, doubling up with, with uh, you know, family members in a car, in transitional housing. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just a fact of life. But what was so interesting, you know, I, I would, would give talks on the, on the work and I wouldn't even use the term homeless or homelessness at all for this particular reason. And people would say, yeah, 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 that, that's good and well. We see how the police are criminalizing homeless people. But what about like normal poor people? What about regular poor people? What about how the police interact <laughs> with them? Right, and, 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 and also thinking like, we're talking about the same segments right below the poverty line. But for some reason, you know, even among some of the smartest academics and even like urban poverty scholars who I would interact with, they have this mythical notion that homeless people are different from poor people along lines where improving our anti-poverty policies somehow won't also help homeless folks. And so I think I, I this is the way like to try and not feel too... Um, dejected about recent, I would say, walking backward in our policies on homelessness. This is this I think it's like if if to to tackle homelessness, I think we have to tackle this kind of like false dichotomy that's been carved um, between between homelessness and 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 poverty. Yeah, I I've flirted with with another book on homelessness because I think it's a lens through which we can view so many of the sort of fundamental contradictions, flaws of our political and economic system that that homelessness is not an adjunct issue it is a core expression yeah. of the yeah. of the economic and political arrangements of this moment and our unwillingness and inability to do anything about that right. says something about our political capacity and also our 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 culture and our our social values etc so I, i've been flirting around with this yeah i it's... still still got my hands full with uh with uh what i'm doing <laughs> now but I'm let sure. me ask you one other question about that yeah. book which was you know, I know originally the focus was on folks living in Skid Row and how they were the object of police action. And then you develop some rapport with some of these cops who you keep coming into contact with while doing the research. And you are able to get some access and to bring them in as subjects of the research. Did you feel some tension about putting them on a similar footing? Do, have you gotten any pushback about that? Yeah, Alex, I can't tell you how much pushback I get. Um, and it's and it's and it's it's usually from I when I wrote that book, I was not expecting to get, you know, I was expecting to be like attacked by um, you know, conservative folks, the police, you know, law and order type advocates who actually for for it for the most part like are are kind of sympathetic to a book that very much calls them out but i was not expecting blowback and resistance from what i would consider my critical lefty social movement colleagues um and and the thing that tends to kind of put them 
um, at unease with the book is the fact that I do include kind of the voices and experiences and biographies of officers. Um, and, and I think there's at one point in the book where I, I, I don't know, I, I, maybe I say this in the book, maybe this is something that I say like when I, when I present about the book, but that the, the cops that I met do not wake up in the morning saying, how am I going to destroy a poor person's life? I say this all the time. Today, right? Yeah, you, you say it. I, and I mean, I think, I, think, I think you and I see similarly on this, right? So, okay. So we have somebody who, do, who wakes up not think, not, who, they don't wake up saying, I want to screw over people's lives today. And in fact, they wake up saying, quite a few of them, and I profile like some army vet, some military veterans waking up saying like, man, there's a lot of social problems out there. I, I, I would love to, 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 to solve some of these things. They wake up with some compassion. And some of them, even if they don't have compassion for poor folks, they wake up thinking like, I want to save the good people, the damsels in distress, and like, I want to lock up the bad guys. And so I think the more I heard these, the more I was like, wow, this is really interesting. How does someone who wakes up and has some compassion um, in their motivation, end up objectively, materially making life worse for people, and and it was actually that question that that like really drove me as a social scientist of wanting to get to the bottom of it. And I actually think it's like a much more important and critical sociological and philosophical question that I think you know goes back to we can think about war in this in this respect. We can think about all kinds of stuff. How do people with good motivations or compassionate motivations end up doing some of the most harmful, disastrous, brutal things possible? And I think the answer is, and it, you know, it's an answer I think you have as well, which is, oh, look, it turns out that like the political, economic, ideological structures that we all have been complicit in creating have put them in a kind of unwinnable situation, have put them in a situation, say like on Skid Row, where we've got a mentally disabled, um, homeless man, maybe he has a history of substance, substance abuse, he's a veteran. We've created a situation in which we turn to that guy with compassion who wants to get the bad guys and we say, hey, go deliver services to that guy. But the, the only services that this cop has is a baton and a taser and a gun. And, and for us to expect for him to deliver some kind of passionate, compassionate services, despite his compassionate motivation, only having the tools of violence and coercion, like we're, we're, we're kidding ourselves. Well, um, or, even, yeah. or even the tools of referral to a social services archipelago I, that is just an, you know, an another elaborate sort of Foucauldian system of social control. And, I, and I think, you know, I, I found myself une really unexpectedly vociferously defending <laughs> you in exactly this way against uh, this the same our same friends and allies uh, much to my surprise and i said look if we can't uh, win this battle if we only understand police as you know evil trumpians mm -hmm. thin blue line right wing you know uh, white supremacists no the well meaning cops Yep. that characterize really the vast majority of them, in my experience, are also causing a tremendous amount of harm. And that yep. what we need right. is a critique, not just of the far right, but of liberalism, mm -hmm. of that well-meaningness that refuses to actually engage the deeper structural questions. Absolutely. And I said, this is so great that we have someone who's laying this out with this ethnographic approach. And so, yeah, I still remain somewhat dumbfounded by, yeah. by these attacks from the left. But I mean, I, I, I get it. I get it. I think that um, as, a, as a, say, a grassroots community organization or as a social movement, um, I think it's, I mean, no, none of the work they do is easy, but I think it's far easier to make the villain, you know, a stormtrooper, yep. cruel, evil person who's perpetrating harms. Like, I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that, that's a pretty easy target, you know? I mean, again, it's not easy, but like that target is a whole lot easier to change or to reform or to abolish than a well-meaning 
uh, perhaps ethnically similar, <laughs> yes, right? Black cop in a black neighborhood who is brutalizing a neighborhood despite the fact that he sees himself as a social worker, despite the fact that he is from that neighborhood and has affinity toward that neighborhood, despite the fact that he loves black folks, doesn't hate black folks. I mean, that one's really, really hard. And unfortunately, that's the one right, that like we need to figure out a systematic analysis to address. Um, and that, so seems, yeah. that seems consistent with like even a, even a radical abolitionist politics, right? Yeah. So that to, to be criticized on the left from that just seems like a thin, thin analysis. Yeah. But yeah, but yeah, it's if, if only our empirical analysis analysis yeah. exist in, in current fields of power, right? That like, yeah, yeah then, then it would be all good, but they're not operating in a vacuum, right? And we're, these, and these critics are our friends. It's not like we're, <laughs> you know, there's just some little, little blind spot here. So uh, now when you moved to Stanford, you got to set up this new ethnography lab. Can, yeah. can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing with that? Yeah, so the ethnography lab is um, something that I'm I'm incredibly excited about, and and I think the way I like to to see it at is is this kind of uh, institute lab that is set up to try to turn Stanford into a place that produces some of the best ethnographic scholars uh, possible. Um, so we've got a series of workshops and programs and kind of team ethnographic projects that are going on at any given time. Um, yeah, that are really just, just trying to increase the kind of uh, profile of ethnography um, at Stanford and, 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 and across the discipline. Um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's directed a lot toward graduate students about supporting them. I feel like for those of us who do qualitative work or historical work or archival work compared to say, I don't know, my very lovely demography colleagues, <laughs> like there's not as much grant money. There's not as much foundational no. money. I mean, NIH and NSF and the Ford Foundation are not, you know, dumping money into folks uh, who are who are thinking about research. I think the way that we do. So this is kind of my way, my way to 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 boost that um, and to bring the resources that Stanford has to bear on questions like the kinds of questions that 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 we're asking. And um, one of the big things that I want to do with this, and and I think Stanford is the perfect kind of place to do this. Is to is to try to inject maybe too forcefully inject an ethnographic ground level perspective into our current fascination and fetishization of big data. Um, I just think that there's so much work being done scraping Twitter, scraping message boards, scraping Reddit, doing natural language processing. Um, that's impressive that you know is really neat but unfortunately i think often suffers from a lack of ground truth um yeah well, this is what we're dealing with here in new york right where the police you know to get back to to the ballot of the bullet right the police are doing that kind of scraping of social media to use as evidence against young people in the creation of criminal conspiracy cases so you know, we're we're working very hard at trying to find out exactly what kinds of software are they using, but we, we know that they're coming into court with binders and binders full of downloaded social media data. And they're using that to construct these claims about, you know, what's a criminal enterprise and, and whose network to whom. Yeah, yeah. You know, this, this much of my drive to try to get big data and, and computer science folks to be thinking a little bit more ethnographically and to maybe talk to the people that they're scraping data from. <laughs> Come, came from, came out of a, a conversation I was having with a federal public defender toward the end of my work. And this federal public defender alerted me to the fact that he, 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 he told me of this case he'd been working on recently where a young man was arrested. It was one of these cases where, you know, cops show up on a corner, guys start to run, Cops tackle the, the person, they arrest them, and they find a, a gun in the bushes. Um, so throughout throughout this case and throughout some other cases, they're bringing in YouTube videos of this person with like a different gun, or they're bringing in Instagram videos of this person, or Instagram photos or, or messages of this person maybe engaging in threatening language. And this public defender 
traced for me the ways in which these things are just like accepted on face value throughout an entire case. So anything from denying someone uh, uh, release, pretrial release, based on the danger they pose to the community, based on, you know, Facebook posts or, or Instagram messages, or even in according to federal sentencing guidelines, right, this young man, he was in fact convicted for this one gun. But the prosecution found two images on his Instagram of two different guns. And according to the federal sentencing guidelines, this was a sentencing enhancement. So mm -hmm. they put three guns on this guy, despite the fact that he was only found guilty for having one gun. And I, and I stopped the public defender as he was telling me this story. And I said, did anyone ask whether or not these were guns were real or like, the, do, is there any question? And, 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 you know, the federal public defender just kind of laughed and was like, they don't care. You know, it's like if they find uh, a, a picture of you with like making fingers in a finger gun, then like they are less likely to give you any kind of pretrial release um, because they're going to use that to show you're a danger to the community. I had a conversation with the uh, then uh, chief of detectives at the NYPD about this. And I said, you know, what's your investigatory backstop to make sure that these boasts and claims and images, you know, are real? Yeah. It's like, well, we, you know, we send it all to a grand jury like that, like that. And he's like, but don't worry, these are all really bad dudes. Right, right. You know, and that's just the mindset. If they weren't guilty of this, they were guilty of something else. So. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I like to I like to close out by asking if there are any books that you've read recently that you'd like to recommend to others. Oh, actually, yes. Um, we uh, part of the ethnography lab. One of the things we do, we have this really fantastic book author series where every quarter we fly in. It's usually a junior faculty member, like an assistant assistant professor. We fly them in. I buy about two dozen copies of their book for everybody affiliated with the ethnography lab. We all read it deeply and then they come in. We have these really cool behind the scenes conversations and really get to the nitty gritty, all the stuff that wasn't in the book we ended up talking about. And actually yesterday we did this virtually um, with Esther Sullivan. She's an assistant professor at University of Colorado, Denver, and she has written this book called Manufactured Insecurity. And it's this ethnography where she lives, I think, almost a couple years in these two trailer parks, one in Texas and one in Florida. And she not only, in a kind of Matt Desmond style, she not only writes about the relationships between residents and between their landlords, her ethnography jumps up to the other levels of the kind of profiteering from poverty to the right. point where she's doing ethnographies in like these these like day long weekend seminars that are put on in like, I don't know, like Orange County, California and like a ritzy hotel to teach you how you too can make money off of trailer trash essentially is like the terms that they're using in these in these um, settings. So it's like it's really I think, you know, to, 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 to an extent that I haven't really seen before, sketching the full picture of how it is that in America, poverty and insecurity is actually like an engine of profit making. Um, and it does it with just like this beautiful writing, you know, she's like crafting metaphor. It's just a beautiful book That's and, great. I, and I highly recommend it. Sounds great, sounds great. Studying up, right? While yeah. seeming to study down, also studying up. Yeah. Really important. Well, uh, Stuart, thanks so, uh, Forrest, sorry. Uh, thanks sorry. so much for joining us. I have a cousin named Forrest, a great Southern name, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks right. for joining us. And uh, the book has just been released, so you can get it now. And um, if you want to subscribe, you can click on the little yellow uh, round button and the rectangular button leads to other interviews. And uh, Forrest, I wish you well in these difficult times. And I hope we get a chance to talk in person before too long. Absolutely. Thank you, Alex. And stay safe and healthy. You bet.